I'm Derek back with you for tonight's installment of Bentonville 156, a Carolina's campaign virtual event. I have the pleasure of introducing Dean Harry as tonight's speaker. Dean is a graduate of Washington Lee University in his native Virginia. And upon moving to North Carolina, Dean received his JD from the North Carolina Central School of Law. He also ran a wine and beer distribution business. Study of the Civil War has always been a major hobby for Dean. He first became interested in the subject during the 1961 through 65 centennial commemorations. Dean has been a Civil War reenactor with Company D, 27th North Carolina Infantry since the early 1990s. And upon retirement, Dean decided that he needed a challenge and became a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg. If you know anything about the licensing requirements at Gettysburg, you know that only the top few in any given year receive their license. Literally and figuratively closer to home, Dean was the founding member of the Friends of Bentonville Battlefield and the organization's president from 2011 through 2019. He remains on the board of directors of the Friends and currently serves as vice president. Dean also created a licensed guide program here at Bentonville, modeled on his experiences at Gettysburg. With both places so near and dear to his heart, it's only apt that Dean is speaking tonight about Brigadier General James S. Robinson, who is in the thick of fighting at both places. Thank you, Dean, for participating. Thank you, Derek. As you can see from the title page, this program focuses on the experiences of Union Regimental and then Brigade Commander James Sidney Robinson. The program is not so much about the man as it is about his experiences at the battles of Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and Bentonville. At each of these battles, the failure of commanders to gather and properly interpret intelligence led to a disaster for Robinson and his men. Each of these disasters occurred with enough warning that they could have been prevented. None of them occurred so early in the war that lack of experience could be blamed. So why did they occur? What might have prevented them? No wisdom tells us that failure is a teachable moment. Oprah Winfrey calls it a stepping stone to success. Former United States Secretary of State and retired four-star General Colin Powell has said that it's an open secret to success. And Bill Rogers told us that good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. Yet yeah, newspapers, history books, and unless you're a rare individual, personal experience tells us that not only do we not learn from the mistakes of others, but also that we often fail to profit from our own mistakes. It goes without saying that leaders should avoid mistakes and demonstrate that he or she knows what they're doing. Mistakes, particularly repeated mistakes, erode the trust followers have in a leader's ability to lead. For military leaders especially, failing to gather or properly interpret intelligence is a mistake. Gettysburg, Little Bighorn, Pearl Harbor are just a few examples. Sometimes, as was the case of Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg, the failure lies in the intelligence gathering process. Other times, such as for George Custer at Little Bighorn, the failure lies in the interpretation process. Sometimes, the intelligence is both there and properly interpreted, but the leader fails to accept good counsel. Benjamin Franklin once wrote, those that won't be counseled can't be helped. This program deals with three instances of the same soldier being victimized by commanders who failed to accept the counsel of staff members with disastrous results. Approximately two million soldiers fought for the Union in the American Civil War. Five of them became presidents of the United States. Many of them achieved great fame during the war, but most have been largely forgotten. One of these largely forgotten soldiers, James Sidney Robinson, began the war as a private and mustered out as a major general. Like most soldiers, his war years had their ups and downs, but perhaps more than most, he seemed destined to be subject to the command of men who would not be counseled. Mansfield, Robinson was born in Mansfield, Ohio on October 14, 1827, and died January 14, 1892 at Kenton, Ohio. Before the war, Robinson edited and published the Kenton Republican newspaper and served as chief clerk of the Ohio House of Representatives. His military service began on April 17, 1861, five days after Southern Shore batteries opened fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Robinson joined the 4th Ohio Infantry as a private. The next day, he was promoted to first lieutenant and two weeks later made captain. He took part in the Battle at Rich Mountain in Western Virginia in October 1861 and was promoted to the rank of major. By August 1862, he was a colonel commanding the 82nd Ohio Infantry. Robertson fought in battles at Cedar Mountain, Second Manassas, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg, where he was severely wounded in the chest. He recovered and then commanded a brigade in the 11th Corps under Major General Joseph Hooker 
and later in the 20th Corps. He participated in the Atlanta campaign, Sherman's March to the Sea, the Carolinas campaign, during which he fought at Bentonville. He received the brevet rank of Major General on March 13, 1865, and mustered out of the Army on August 31st. Post-war, he served as a representative in the 47th and 48th United States Congresses and as Secretary of State of Ohio. Uh, Robinson had a quick wit and a droll sense of humor. One of his acquaintances described him as the typical John Bull, but every inch an American. He is a tall, somewhat huge man with a clear, weighty voice and strong convictions, frank in their expression. 1862 was a bad year for the Union. The second defeat suffered by a Union army at Manassas, Virginia, made it apparent to President Lincoln that yet another reorganization of command was required. He asked Navy Secretary Gideon Wells who should take command. Hooker, Wells answered. Lincoln responded, I like him too, but I fear he gets excited. Postmaster General Montgomery Blair thought him too good a friend of John Barleycorn. Not yet desperate enough to ignore Hooker's reputation, Lincoln turned once again to George McClellan. Major General Joseph Hooker, however, was given a corps in McClellan's Army of the Potomac. On September 17th, he opened the battle at Antietam by launching a powerful attack on the Confederate left held by Stonewall Jackson. As fighting surged back and forth through the east and west woods, David Miller's cornfield and around the Decker Church, Hooker seemed to be everywhere, never away from the fire, and all the troops believed in their commander and fought with a will. He was finally struck in the foot by a sharpshooter's bullet, carried from the field. He shouted, there's a regiment to the right, order it forward. Tell them to carry the woods and hold them, and it's our fight. From the hospital, Hooker wrote his brother-in-law, I only regret that I was not permitted to take part in the operations until they were concluded, for I had counted on either capturing their army or driving them into the Potomac. He testified to congressional investigators that his troops had whipped Jackson and compelled the enemy to fly. Mullins agreed, had you not been wounded when you were, I believe the results of the battle would have been the destruction of the entire rebel army. While recuperating in Washington, Hooker was happy to describe his battles to powerful Washington politicians, including President Lincoln, all the while denouncing McClellan who held the job Hooker wanted. He was not above a little backstabbing to get it. Hooker's campaign for elevation to Army command was unsuccessful, and Lincoln instead appointed Ambrose Burnside to command the Army of the Potomac. Burnside had argued that no one, including himself, was competent to command the Army. But faced with the realization that McClellan could not be saved, and by refusing command, he would force Lincoln to appoint Burnside's rival and nemesis, Hooker, Burnside accepted command. Not one to give up easily, Hooker began a campaign of bitter complaints about Burnside's leadership qualities, first in the newspapers, and then after Burnside's failed attempts at Fredericksburg to Congress's Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Fed up with Hooker's backstabbing, Burnside finally demanded that Lincoln choose him or Hooker. Lincoln, responding that the Army had lost faith, and recognizing, let's say, that the Army had lost faith in Burnside, had little choice but to choose Hooker. Hooker assumed command of a greatly demoralized Army of the Potomac. The morning report of January 30, 1863 showed 147,184 present and equipped for duty, but 30,000 of these were due to be mustered out in a few months. A soldier in the 140th Pennsylvania Infantry wrote, now I hear that Burnside is removed and Hooker has his place. He will make a failure or two, and then I hope McClellan's turn will come again. If they don't give McClellan or someone the Army has confidence in, the Army may turn into an armed mob and throw down their arms and go home. I have seen lieutenants, captains, and colonels so drunk they fall off the horses in the mud, and still the papers say this Army isn't demoralized. As my messmate says, they don't count drunks. Over the next several months, Hooker instituted a system of furloughs, provide soldiers with fresh bread and vegetables, pushed Dr. Jonathan Letterman's upgrading of the medical department and paid closer attention to sanitary details. He made major, major improvements to the Army's intelligence arm and reorganized the cavalry, heretofore dispersed among corps and divisions, into a powerful three-division corps. Things improved dramatically for the Army of the Potomac, but if the improved morale was to last, 
a victory over the Army of Northern Virginia was essential. On April 27, 1863, Hooker put his plan to deliver that victory by crossing the Rappahannock River with more men at more points faster than his opponent Robert E. Lee could have imagined began to unfold. Before daybreak, with eight days' rations, cartridge boxes loaded, an extra round, 20 rounds stuffed into their pockets, the soldiers of the 11th Corps filed onto the road and began to march. Where they were going, they did not know. That they were headed to a fight seemed a certainty. Hooker's choice to place the 11th Corps in front seemed curious. The soldiers of the 11th Corps were considered the outcast of his army. As a corps, they had joined the Army of the Potomac just after Fredericksburg. The rest of the army refused to welcome soldiers who had missed the carnage of that December debacle. Moreover, many of the 11th Corps regiments were considered foreign, German-speaking soldiers, led by commanders with German names such as Sertz, von Steinmeier, Schimmelfinnig, and Koenig. Until recently, they had been commanded by German-born Font Siegel, and the soldiers had proudly boasted, I fight Smith Siegel. But Siegel, unhappy with him when Hooker's reorganization of the army, made his the smallest corps, resigned. The proud boast was now turned to a, to a taunt by the rest of the army. At 3.30 on the afternoon of the 27th, President Lincoln telegraphed Hooker, how's it going? Ninety minutes later, Hooker answered, I'm not sufficiently advanced to give an opinion. We are busy. I'll tell you as soon as I can. Soon after, a chill rain began. Henry Slocum's 12th Corps slogged on close behind the 11th, followed by George Meade's 5th Corps. Senior to both Howard and Meade, Slocum commanded the marching column. The next day, the head of the column neared Kelly's Ford, and officers passed the word to observe strict silence. The only intelligence Jeb Stewart, an excellent judge of enemy, enemy, enemy numbers and intentions, could offer Lee was that a large body of infantry and artillery was passing up the river. Hooker's plan called for Slocum to move beyond the Rappahannock, push on across the Rapidan and, pass, and back past Chancellorsville. If not confronted by a strong force, he was to select a strong position and compel him to attack you on your ground. Hooker emphasized, not a moment be lost until all our troops are established at or near Chancellorsville. From that moment, all will be ours. By the evening of the 29th, Hooker's right wing controlled the fords across the Rappahannock and Rapidan Rivers west of Fredericksburg and was advancing in force on Chancellorsville. That same day, Hooker's left wing, commanded by Major General John Sedgwick, made its move against Lee's carefully constructed defenses below Fredericksburg. Sedgwick's mission was to keep the rebels busy and hold them in place. Lee awakened to the crackle of gunfire on the morning of April 29th, but assumed if anything serious were going on, someone would come and tell him. Without waiting for orders, Jubal early sent his troops into line along the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad, a mile south of the river shown at the top of the screen. He also sent Major Samuel Hale to inform Stonewall Jackson that the enemy was advancing in force. Soldiers sprung into action as drummers beat the long wall all along the line. Lee, looking out from a bluff commanding the developing bridgehead, could see Union troops spreading out and approaching the very ground he had hoped but did not expect they might attack. Unknown to Lee, Hooker now had three Union Corps across the Rappahannock and on their way to the Rapidan west of Fredericksburg. Lee knew only that Howard's 11th Corps had crossed at Kelly's Ford. Towards dusk, a cavalryman brought word to Lee that the Union force upriver was moving across the Rapidan and towards his flank. A detailed message from Jeb Jim Stewart that Howard's Corps was coming down across the Rapidan finally convinced Lee that Hooker intended to turn Lee's left or gain his rear. Union columns west of Chancellorsville moved again at daybreak on April 30th. Skirmishers pushed out ahead of the force through the forbidding darkness of the second growth tangled forest of the wilderness. Uh, as columns closed on the crossroad at Chancellorsville, they met resistance from Brigadier General William Mahone's Brigade of Virginians. Heavily outnumbered, Mahone beat a hasty retreat toward Fredericksburg. Just moments after the Confederates left Chancellorsville, Meade's 5th Corps filled the crossroads clearing. Meade arrived at the Chancellor House around 11 a.m. Early in the afternoon, Slocum's 12th Corps columns began to arrive from the west. Meade was elated at Slocum's appearance. This is splendid, Slocum. Arrive for old Joe. We're on Lee's flank and he didn't know it. You take the plank road toward Fredericksburg, 
I'll take the punic or vice versa if you prefer, and we'll get out of this wilderness. Slocum answered, my orders are to assume command on arriving at this point and take up the line of battle here. Meade was deflated by the change in plans, but not so the men who had been nervous about the march, recognizing how vulnerable to attack they had been as they made their way across the wilderness, having gained the open ground of Chancellorsville without incident, they now felt the danger had passed. They could not have been more mistaken. Hooker gloated that he had Lee right where he wanted him. Most thing that Lee must ingloriously fly or come out from behind his defenses where certain destruction awaits him to his corps commanders. Hooker said, God Almighty could not prevent my destroying the rebel army. But Brigadier General Alphys Williams, commanding a division in the 12th Corps, expressed the concerns of many of Hooker's generals when he wrote his daughter, there was too much busting and too little planning. Swagger without preparation. Lee reacted to Hooker's bold move with a plan of his own. First, Lee took measures to secure the highest ground in the area, the zone in Tabernacle Church's Ridge, above uh, left on their screen, with Major General Richard H. Anderson's division. Deciding that Union troops at Fredericksburg posed a minimal threat, Lee split his army by ordering Jackson to leave a small force at Fredericksburg and to advance the bulk of his wing towards his own church ridge. Jackson's troop arrived at dawn on May 1st with orders to defend the ridge. Jackson decided the best way to defend it would be to keep Hooker's men from getting anywhere near it. Jackson ordered Anderson's men to put down their shovels and pick up their muskets and quickly launched an attack on Hooker's three advancing columns. Even though all three columns had been making progress, Hooker ordered them to fall back toward Chantersville. Sykes was dumbstruck and his men confounded, not at being ordered into danger, but at being ordered out. Slocum thought the order a little short of treason and arrested the courier, Washington A. Roebling, a future Brooklyn Bridge fan. George Meade, whose troops were within sight of Banks Ford, said, my God, if we can't hold the top of the hill, we certainly can't hold the bottom of it. Nevertheless, the Union troops fell back and the Army of the Potomac assumed a defensive position around the Chantersville crossroads. Howard's 11th Corps occupied the westernmost position along the Orange Turnpike. Less than a mile southeast of Chancellorsville, Lee met with Jackson and discussed today's events. Lee believed Hooker's main force held Chancellorsville and that he must drive the enemy back to the Rapidan. Jackson, whose men had barely pressured the Federals before they fell back to Chancellorsville, fully expected them to retreat across the Rappahannock River before dawn. Lee persuaded Jackson to help him make contingencies should Hooker not retreat. He agreed that Union defensive positions at Chancellorsville were strong, and then Jeb Stewart arrived with surprising news. The Union right flank, held by Howard's 11th Corps, had failed to fortify their position or anchor it on any natural defense. Dawn on May 2nd found Hooker still held Chancellorsville. Now Lee and Jackson agreed that Hooker had surrendered the initiative and that by banning the furnace road the day before, had provided them with the means to take advantage of it. With the help of Lee's map maker, Jedediah Hotkiss, a route to the exposed right of Hooker's line was drawn up. Lee queried Jackson, what do you propose to do? Go around here, Jackson answered, tracing a line on Lee's map. What do you propose to make this movement with? A whole corps was the answer. Lee asked, what will you leave me? Jackson suggested the divisions of Anderson and McClaws. Waiting for a moment, Lee softly answered, we'll go on. At 7 a.m. on May 2nd, Jackson's force of nearly 27,000 started on a 12-mile hike around the Union Army. Lee was to try to hold Hooker's attention at Chancellorsville with 13,000 and Jubal Early would guard Lee's rear at Fredericksburg with 10,000. Lee's plan involved a high degree of risk, but it was not a gamble with its outcome predicated on luck. And should things go badly, each of Lee's separated forces could fall back on Spotsylvania Courthouse, thereby avoiding disaster. Jackson's flanking force was discovered on the march. At 9 a.m., Hooker messaged Howard. The position you have made of your corps has been with a view towards a front attack by the enemy. If he should throw himself upon your flank, the right of your line does not appear to be strong enough. No artificial defenses worth naming have been thrown up, and there appears to be a scarcity of troops at that point. 
We have good reason to suppose that the enemy is moving to our right. Please advance your pickets for the purposes of observation as far as may be safe. But even then, Hooker misinterpreted Lee's intention and convinced himself that Lee was fleeing the battlefield. Jackson continued the flanking movement and at 3 p.m. scribbled a note to Lee. The enemy has made a stand at Chancellor's, which is about two miles from Chancellorsville. I hope as soon as practicable to attack. A mile to the east, Howard's 11th Corps, including Colonel Robinson and the 82nd Ohio, relaxed, cooked, and browsed in the woods around the Hawkins and Talley Farms, Dowdell Tavern, and the Wilderness Church, completely unaware of the danger building nearby. As ordered, pickets had advanced beyond Howard's right, but few other measures to protect the 11th Corps flank had been taken. Union pickets stumbled on Confederate pickets and reported their presence to Division Commander Brigadier General Charles Devins, Jr., who dismissed the warning. Concerned, the pickets went over Devin's head and warned Howard directly. Unable to say whether Jackson had hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of troops, Howard dismissed their warnings without bothering to investigate. As Benjamin Franklin said, those that won't be counseled can't be helped. Shortly before 5.15, Outside his 11th floor post at Dowdell's Tavern, Oliver Otis Howard told a battery of gunners to unharness their horses and feed them. We'll be off to Richmond at daylight, he told them. Not long after, two miles left, Stonewall Jackson turned and asked Robert Rhodes if he were ready. Rhodes answered that he was, and Jackson said quietly, we may go forward then. More than 20,000 Confederates surged forward on a two-mile front. Terrified wildlife fled in mass before them, a mile away, a Union band played as the troops cooked rations. Colonel Leopold von Gilsa commanded the brigade guarding Howard's right flank. He had two regiments to protect the turnpike, a 200-yard front to oppose a two-mile front of Confederates. Von Gilsa hurried to Howard's headquarters to demand reinforcements. Howard answered, with the help of God, you have to keep this position. Von Gilsa would have none of it and angrily replied, to the devil with such talk, but what avail is God's help only? I must have soldiers. Jackson's attack unhinged Howard's right and easily overran Devon's troops along the turnpike facing south. Devon's was slightly wounded and left the field. His replacement, Nathaniel C. McClellan, also fell, McClain also fell wounded. Leaderless and overwhelmed, the division collapsed. Brigadier General Charles, Carl Schertz's division was hit next. Schertz quickly abandoned his headquarters at the Hawkins farm. Colonel Vladimir Krasnowski maneuvered his brigade into the line of rise behind the Hawkins farmhouse, where it exchanged fire with Confederates at a very short distance. Faced with total annihilation, Krasnowski galloped down the line, screaming, for God's sakes, men, fall back. Robert Rhodes commented, they fled the field in wildest confusion, leaving the field strewn with arms, accoutrements, clothing, caissons, and field pieces in every direction. Union troops splashed through a small creek behind Wilderness Church where they encountered General Howard on horseback near Dowdall's Tavern. Howard pleaded with the men to stand. Halt! Halt! I'm ruined! I'm ruined! He later admitted he wanted to die and sought death everywhere. 82nd Ohio with James Robinson was posted just west of the Hawkins farmhouse when the Jacksons attack struck. At the same time, in Hardin County, Ohio, a friend was writing Robinson a letter which Robinson answered two weeks later. Her letter of May 2nd duly received. While you was writing that letter, we were enjoying the luxury of cannonballs and musketry, and late in the evening treated ourselves to a foot race on a grand scale, in which all other officers and men in the 11th Corps retired for the prize. Our Brigadier General won the stakes. He imitated the example of the militia captain and started early in the race, but being a favorite at headquarters and that kind of fleetness not in the bills, the papers have failed to inform the public of the exact time it required to get from the front to the river under fire of the enemy. It is us poor devils who were branded as cowards who stood at our post and tried to stem the torrent until it was reduced to a certainty that one or two things had to be done, either run or be killed or gobbled up. I remember just about that time, that favorite and familiar stanza, that he who fights and runs away will live to fight another day. And so I gave the order to march and retreat. This movement under fire is easily executed. It amounts to simply an about face, and then the run comes in. 
This is a movement in which the field officers are supposed to be in the advance. Once the Army of the Potomac had withdrawn north of the Rappahannock River, it was again too strong for Lee to attack. Badly needing supplies and hoping to pull the Union Army away from Richmond, where he could battle it on favorable ground of his choosing, Lee put his army in motion. Confederate columns snaked north through the Shenandoah and Cumberland Valleys, all the while protected by the Blue Ridge Mountains. Hooker ordered to do so by President Lincoln eventually followed. On June 28th, with the Union Army situated near Frederick, Maryland, Hooker was replaced by Union 5th Corps Commander Major General George Gordon Meade. The 11th Corps, located not far from Emmitsburg, Maryland, along with the 1st and 3rd Corps, became Meade's left wing. At approximately 7.30 a.m. on July 1st, a Confederate division on a reconnaissance supply gathering mission encountered two Union cavalry brigades commanded by Brigadier General John Buford just west of the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Despite orders to avoid bringing on a general engagement, Confederates continued to advance. Buford quickly called for support from left wing commander Major General John Fulton Reynolds, who hurriedly set the 1st Corps in motion towards Gettysburg and ordered Howard to do the same with the 11th Corps. And the Howard immediately set his three divisions in motion towards Gettysburg. Howard arrived at Gettysburg at approximately 10 a.m., well before his troops, and sent aides in different directions searching for General Reynolds. The CERN learned that Reynolds had been killed. Howard assumed command of the left wing and instructed General Schertz to take command of the 11th Corps. Howard showed amazing hindsight after the war when he wrote, after an examination of the general features of the country, I came to the conclusion that the only tenable position for my limited force was on the ridge to the southeast of Gettysburg, now so well known as Cemetery Ridge. Howard was joined on Cemetery Hill by, by shirts at approximately 11.30 a.m. They can see Confederates all two miles away on Oak Hill, but were unable to assess their strength. Shirts who did not remember Howard's assessment of the situation exactly as Howard did, later wrote, I saw the First Corps engage in a lively fight on the ridge northwest of Gettysburg. A dispatch from General Wadsworth informed us that the forces before him were apparently not very strong and that he thought that the enemy was making a movement towards his right. Of the enemy, we saw but little and had no means of forming a just estimate of the strength. Either the army was before us in small force, and then we had to push him with all possible vigor, or we had the principal part of his army there, and then we had to establish ourselves in a position which would enable us to maintain ourselves until the arrival of reinforcements. Either of these cases being possible, provision was made for both. Howard ordered Church to post two divisions to the right of the First Corps on Oak Ridge while von Steinwehr and the reserve artillery were to remain on Cemetery Hill. Schertz ordered Alexander Schimmelfennig to deploy the 3rd Division on the right of the 1st Corps, then holding Oak Ridge. Schimmelfennig placed Colonel George von Amsburg Brigade on the left of a line that extended from the Mummersburg Road towards the Carlisle Road. Colonel Krasnowski's Brigade followed Schimmelfennig to the field and halted just north of the grounds of Pennsylvania College. There they massed in double column on center, the 82nd Ohio on the left by the Mummersburg Road, 75th Pennsylvania, 119th New York, 26th Wisconsin, extending the line to the right. There, in this deep formation of solid squares, they were especially vulnerable to artillery fire directed to them from Oak Hill. Barlow's division followed Simulfinnings through the town and took up a position on its right. Barlow, a Harvard-educated lawyer from uh, New York, was an unhappy member of the 11th Corps uh, who claimed he had been seduced into taking over the 1st Division. After Chancellorsville, he wrote his mother of his indignation and disgust at the behavior of the 11th Corps and that he had always been down on the Dutch. Church ordered uh, Francis Barlow to place his two brigade division on the right of the line with Von Gilsa connecting with Krasnowski. Barlow's two brigades entered the plain north of Gettysburg and took up their place on the right. Krasnowski. The thoughts of the 11th Corps soldiers must have drifted, drifted back to the last battle, Chancellorsville. Once again, they faced an enemy of unknown size advancing towards them on two fronts. 
As Confederate Major General Jubal Early's division approached Gettysburg along the Harrisburg Road, Early and his staff uh, immediately recognized that he was that they were approaching the enemy's right flank and shouted to his adjutant, Major John W. Daniel, tell Gordon, Hayes, Avery, and Smith to double quick to the front and open the lines of infantry for artillery to pass. Gordon's brigade, leading the column, swung into line of battle, and Jones' battalion of artillery came thundering to the front as they took up their positions. Early could see that Union troops in front were not yet ready to receive his attack. Jones' guns opened with a war on the masses of artillery to their front. For reasons never explained, Barlow then left his assigned position right of Krasnowski and advanced to a small piece of high ground to his front, front blockers null. In a letter to his mother, he wrote, I had an admiral position. The county was, uh, country was an open one for a long distance around and could be easily swept by our artillery. We ought to have held the place easily, for I had my entire force at the very point where the attack was made. No doubt, to Barlow, the higher ground must have seemed an attractive place. However, as time would tell, he had blundered, and in doing so, had doomed the 11th Corps to yet another defeat. As Barlow advanced the bulk of his command of Blocker's Knoll, George Dole's brigade of Georgians approached from the north. At the same time, John Brown Gordon's George's Georgia Brigade advanced from the Northeast, both aiming for Blocker's Knoll. Their arrival was a complete surprise to Barlow and his men. The same two brigades had suffered the brunt of Stonewall Jackson's attack, May 1st at Chancellorsville, now found themselves in the same predicament. Gordon's men quickly overwhelmed four companies of the 17th Connecticut at the Benner Farm, two Confederate brigades connected, and 2,800 Georgians struck Barlow's right flank. Gordon wrote afterwards, moving forward under heavy fire over rail and plank fences, this brigade rushed upon the enemy with a resolution and spirit, in my opinion, barely excelled. Dole's brigade struck Ames' left flank as Gordon struck the right flank. Ames ordered six companies of the 17th Connecticut forward in an attempt to save Lieutenant Bayard Wilkerson's guns posted on the knoll. Lieutenant Douglas Fowler, commanding the regiment, yelled out, now 17th, do your duty, forward, double quick. Charge bayonets. With a shot, the men moved forward, but as they neared the crest of the knoll, Bowers' head was shattered by an exploding shell. So Bowers held for a moment and then fell back, leaving the 25th and 75th Ohio open to attack from three sides. Ames himself led the 75th Ohio in a charge to cover their retreat. The 75th Ohio lost half its men in a fight that lasted just 15 minutes. The major difficulty with Barlow's unauthorized movement was that it severed all connection with Schertz and expanded the gap between the two divisions. Schertz realized he must deal with the situation immediately, relying on Howard, who had continually ignored his calls for reinforcements, seemed out of the question. To fill the gap, Krasnowski's brigade, including the 82nd Ohio and James Robinson, was ordered forward. Barlow's division had already begun to falter. Krasnowski advanced the brigade in a mass column. Captain Alfred E. Lee of the 82nd Ohio described the scene. Enemy batteries swept the plane completely from two or three different directions, and their shells plunged through our solid squares, making terrible havoc, yet the line swept steadily on. As the brigade neared the 107th Ohio on Barlow's left, a Confederate battle line appeared from the ravine of Blocker's Run. Their movements were firm and steady as usual, and their banners bearing the blue southern, southern cross wanted impudently and seemed to challenge combat. On they came, one line after another in splendid array. Krasnowski noticed the 21st Georgia, commanded by Colonel John Thomas Mercer, deployed in a wheat field and orders his, his brigade to deploy an open fire. Outnumbered, the Georgians fell back. Dulles reacted by shifting the 44th and 4th Georgia regiments to face the Federals and advanced them to within 75 yards of the enemy. Union soldiers held their fire until an officer shouted, let them have it. Captain Lee wrote, smoke belched from the, smoke belched from the blue line and quick as a flash, the compliment was returned. Bullets hummed about our ears like infuriated bees. The lines, the lines blazed away at such short distance that Captain Lee thought he might have read the battle honors on Confederate battle flags if he had had the time to do so. 
Private George Nichols of the 61st Georgia admitted, we had a hard time moving them. We advanced with our custom yell, but they stood firm until we got near them. They began to retreat in fine order, shooting us as they retreated. They were harder to drive than we had ever known them before, as men were being mowed down on both sides. Captain William Evans of the 4th Georgia agreed, Yankees were in large numbers and fought more stubbornly than I ever saw them or ever want to see them again. Several times, we were not 50 yards apart. As the battle raged, Krasnowski galloped along the line, shouting words of encouragement. As his horse attempted to jump a fence, he was struck by a lead ball and fell. General fell hard on his chest, and the animal landed on the general's left side. Pain shot through him as he struggled to breathe and finally passed out. Assistant Charles Stein of the 58th New York rushed to the general and found him unconscious. The brigade's next ranking officer was Colonel Flint Smaller of the 75th Pennsylvania. Smaller and his horse were both struck at the same time, the animal falling and painting mauling underneath. He managed to free himself, rushed to the left flank of the regiment. While encouraging the men to remain steadfast, he was cut down by another bullet falling not far from his dead brother, Lieutenant Lewis Mahler. With both Krasnowski and Mahler down, the brigade command devolved on James Robinson. Every field officer of the 82nd Ohio had had their horse shot from under them. Robinson observed from this point, we were gradually being pressed back by the power of overwhelming numbers. The men stubbornly contested every inch of ground. Our position was in every respect untenable. A thin filleted fire ripping through the brigade, Robinson had no choice but to order the brigade to retreat towards the town, firing at will. As the 11th Corps resistance disintegrated on the plain of Gettysburg, Howard released finally released Coster's brigade to help stem the tide. Captain Lewis Heckman's 1st Ohio Light Battery K had moved from Cemetery Hill with Coster. The battery had gone into position near the Carlisle Road, even though their ability to fire their four Napoleons was hampered by fleeing Union troops between them and the enemy, Hackman reported that the battery fired for approximately 30 minutes and expended 113 rounds. Colonel Robinson, retreating with the brigade, had paused at the battery to point out targets for his guns when a bullet plowed into his upper chest near the shoulder. Robinson was carried to the home of two maiden ladies sisters of Edward McPherson located across the street from the railroad station. The home was owned by U.S. Deputy Commissioner of Internal Revenue, Edward McPherson, whose farm just west of Gettysburg was the scene of heavy fighting on July 1st. Robinson lay on the kitchen floor of the home on the night of July 1st without medical attention. He poured water into the wound, which ran through my body like a sieve. He refused to allow himself to imagine the wound was mortal, and in later years, was convinced that this self-treatment had saved his life. Krasnowski's brigade had been shot to pieces. 119th New York suffered uh, 100 casualties in a few minutes. The 82nd Ohio lost two captains, five lieutenants, and more than 150 of its 258 men. The 26th Wisconsin suffered 217 casualties out of 446 men. While there were the usual post-battle disagreements about which regiment had retreated first, Captain Lee believed it sufficient to say that the entire line went back and the difference in time was not worth noting. For most of the soldiers of the 11th Corps who had fought at both Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, there would have seen little difference between the results of the July 1st at Gettysburg and that of May 2nd at Chancellorsville. Through no fault of their own, the soldiers had been placed in an untenable position against overwhelming odds with predictable results. The difference, of course, lay in what happened next. At Chancellorsville, General Fighting Joe Hooker allowed victory to slip from his grasp and handed Lee perhaps his greatest victory of the war. At Gettysburg, the Army of the Potomac, led now by George Gordon Meade, was able to fight defensively and secured a much needed victory over Lee and his army. Following Gettysburg, a reorganization of the Union armies took place. General Meade replaced Daniel Butterfield, whom he, who he had reluctantly inherited as chief of staff from Joseph Hooker. Butterfield, who had been convalescing from a wound suffered at Gettysburg, returned to duty as chief of staff for Joseph Hooker, now commanding the 11th and 12th Corps, which had been transferred to the Army of the Cumberland. 
The 20th Corps was formed on April 4th, 1864 by taking the 12th Corps, composed of the veteran 12th Corps divisions of Williams and Geary, and adding to it the newly formed division commanded by Butterfield. At the same time, two divisions of the 11th Corps were broken up and distributed to the divisions of Williams, Geary, and Butterfield. After recovering from his Gettysburg wound, Robinson returned to duty on March 13, 18, 1864, commanding 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 20th Corps, Army of the Cumberland. The brigade consisted of the 82nd Illinois, 61st Ohio, and 82nd Ohio from the 11th Corps, the two new additions, 143rd New York and 31st Wisconsin. Meade's victory at Gettysburg and the simultaneous fall of Vicksburg proved to be a turning point in the war. By December of 1864, proof of ultimate Union victory seemed well in hand. Major General William Tecumseh Sherman had completed his march to the sea and occupied one of the last remaining viable Confederate seaports, Savannah, Georgia. In the east, uh, Union General-in-Chief Ulysses Grant was deadlocked with Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Petersburg. Grant, anxious to end the war, his outcome now seemed certain, realized that the war would end only when Lee's Army was destroyed. He ordered Sherman to put his army on transports and ship his troops to Virginia with all dispatch. General Sherman disapproved of the plan and proposed an alternative. Ship his army to 60,000 effectives and march through the Carolinas to Virginia, making war against the South's industrial, agricultural, and transportation capacity. How will you supply your army? Grant asked. Sherman answered, where the people can live, so can we, and if someone has to be without. Let it be there. Grant agreed, and in February, Sherman began his march through South Carolina. On January 23, 1865, the Confederate Congress in Richmond, to voice their displeasure with President Jefferson Davis, created the position of General in Chief of the Confederate States Army. General Lee became the first and only Confederate officer to hold this position. Lee quickly sent the following message to General Joseph Johnson, then without a command. Assume command of all troops in the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Concentrate all available forces and drive back Sherman. Johnson wired back, it's too late to expect me to concentrate troops capable of driving back Sherman. Johnson knew that Lee's army locked in trench warfare at Petersburg subsisted on supplies arriving on North Carolina railroads. Nevertheless, Johnson asked Lee, is it so important to prevent the interruption of the road by Raleigh by which you are supplied as to make it proper to fight here with the chances of winning so against us. He went on to suggest that he collect his command and come to Petersburg to help defeat the Army of the Potomac, and then Lee and Johnston could turn their attention toward Sherman. Lee answered quickly, I fear I cannot hold my position if the road by Raleigh is interrupted. Should you be forced back in this direction, both armies would certainly starve. On March 11, 1865, Sherman's forces had crossed the Petey River into North Carolina and occupied the city of Fayetteville, 35 miles west of Bentonville. Sherman knew that if he could capture Raleigh or Weldon and break Lee's supply line, Lee would be forced to abandon Petersburg and venture out into the open, where he would stand little chance against the combined forces of Grant and Sherman. On March 13th, General Johnson made his decision. For just the second time in his career, he would take the offensive. His first objective was to concentrate his forces at Smithfield, just north of the Neuse River and on the North Carolina Railroad. From there, as soon as Sherman committed towards Raleigh or Goldsboro, Johnston could attack one of Sherman's isolated columns. By March 15th, Sherman had crossed the Cape Fear River at Fayetteville, and the next day made one of the few mistakes of his Carolinas campaign when he failed to recognize the importance of the Confederate delaying action in Averysboro, just east of Fayetteville. Stout Confederate resistance there slowed the Union 20th Corps and increased the distance between the two wings of Sherman's army. Following the Aversboro battle, Sherman believed that Johnson's army was north of an impassable stream, Mill Creek, and that Johnson had chosen to defend the capital of North Carolina, Raleigh. Sherman's goal then was to reach Goldsboro and the much needed supplies waiting for him there. On March 18th, Confederate Chief of Cavalry Lieutenant General Wade Hampton notified Johnston that the Union Army was moving towards Goldsboro, not Raleigh, and that the two wings of Sherman's army were more than a half day's march apart. 
Then it was Slocum's left wing with the 14th Corps, commanded by Major General Jefferson C. Davis, was moving all east on the Goldsboro Road. Hampton informed Johnston that a road ran from Smithfield to the hamlet of Bentonville, located on the Goldsboro Road, and the bridge over Mill Creek at Bentonville remained intact. By dispatch, Johnston asked Hampton whether Sherman's wing could be intercepted from Smithfield before it reached Goldsboro. Hampton replied that it could be and recommended a surprise attack at the eastern end of the coal plantation, about two miles south of the bridge over Mill Creek at Bentonville. Johnston messaged to Hampton, I'm coming to you and attempt your, screen, your scheme. And then Johnston ordered three columns of Confederates to converge at Bentonville, the Army of Tennessee, commanded by Alexander P. Stewart, the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, commanded by William Hardy, and the Department of North Carolina, consisting only of Robert Hoke's division. Johnston, emboldened by what he perceived as renewed confidence in him on the part of General Lee, and cognizant of the fact that if Sherman reached Goldsboro, he would be too strong to oppose, saw an opportunity to crush one of Sherman's uh, wings while it was separated from the other. All that was needed was to position his army on the Goldsboro Road near Bentonville and set the trap. On the evening of uh, Saturday, March 18, 1865, Hampton explained his plan to Johnson. Oaks division would form across the Goldsboro Road as a blocking force while Stewart positioned the Army of Tennessee on the right, nearly parallel to the road within the tree line bordering the Coles Great Open Field. General Hardy was to position himself in the center between Stewart and Hope. Once the federal column advancing east on the Goldsboro Road made contact with Hope's blocking force, Stewart was to attack the federal left flank and echelon from the right. The left wing of Sherman's army was commanded by Major General Henry Warner Slocum and composed of two corps, the 14th and the 20th. 14th Corps commanded by Jefferson C. Davis and the 20th Corps by Major General Alpheus S. Williams. 14th Corps led the march on, on March 19th with William P. Carlin's division in front, followed by the 2nd Division commanded by James Data Morgan. At 4 a.m., Two foraging parties, one commanded by 18-year-old Captain Charles Belknap and the other by Major James Holmes, began moving east on the Goldsboro Road. Belknap had noticed the increased resistance of Confederate cavalry opposing their advance and warned Carlin of his concerns. Carlin passed Belknap's report on to General Sherman, who gave it little credit. Neither did Carlin. Carlin's final instructions to Belknap were, if you can't drive the enemy, flank them. Benjamin Franklin said it. Those that won't be counseled can't be helped. Had a ravine just west of the John Harper home, Belknap's bummers ran into a Confederate skirmish line. Shots were fired, and Confederates hastily retreated a mile or so to the east. The bummers followed, but stopped when they saw hundreds of Confederates visibly entrenching to their front. Belknap watched for a moment, officers shouting for the men to fall in line, and men throwing away their shovels and securing their guns, and then led his force back to the ravine. Several other foraging details ran into the Confederate line that had stopped Belknap's foragers and found the force too large to drive a flank. At 6 a.m. near present-day Newton Grove, General Sherman, Slocum, and Davis sat mounted on their horses, listening to the growing volume of fire towards the northeast. Davis suggested that perhaps Confederates were gathered there in force. Sherman listened for a few moments and then told Davis there was nothing to it, just Confederate cavalry. Slocum agreed, but Davis told Sherman he believed they were likely to encounter more than the usual cavalry opposition. No, Jeff, Sherman answered. There's nothing there but cavalry. Brush them out of the way. I'll meet you tomorrow morning. Sherman then left to rejoin General Howard's right wing on the march to Goldsboro. At 7 a.m., Carlin moved the division to column of fours with bands playing and colors unfurled. He was dressed in his best uniform and expected no trouble. After meeting stiffening resistance, Major Holmes, commanding one of the groups of bummers that left early that morning, rode back to Carlin and reported that he had pushed down Johnston's line. Carlin responded immediately and patiently by ordering Holmes to get his bummers out of the way and boasted that he would drive the rebels with a skirmish line. Carlin ordered Brigadier General Harrison C. Hobart to deploy his brigade and drive the rebel skirmishers from the woods beyond Morris Farm. 
Hobart deployed his brigade in two wings of three regiments each. Skirmishers were deployed and the brigade began to advance, taking fire from Confederate cavalry barricades in the woods to their front. To the west, Slocum's column continued to advance slowly, despite the increasing volume of musketry to their front. Meanwhile, Hobart's two wings lost contact with each other as Union skirmishers drove Confederate cavalry from the woods and threw a big storm. Davis accompanied Carlin to the front. Slocum arrived and joined the group as Confederate cavalry was being driven off. The three Union commanders had no way of knowing it, but Hobart's brigade was headed directly towards Hope's division of approximately 3,600 men, augmented by 700 men in division's artillery contingent, plus 1,200 boys of the North Carolina Junior Reserve, for a possible total, the total of approximately 5,500 officers and men. To make matters worse, the 5,000 or so men of the Army of Tennessee were filing into position right of hope. Hobart continued to advance both wings of his brigade, but they were now separated and there was a gap along the Goldsboro Road. When Lieutenant Colonel Cyrus E. Bryant's wing north of the road reached the Cold Farmhouse, the North Carolina Junior Reserves and Atkins Battery opened fire. The men of the 33rd Ohio quickly took shelter in the farmhouse but were soon driven from it. They went into a wooded to the wooded ravine to their left and began to entrench on the forward slope. Atkins Battery shifted its fire to Fitch's wing south of the road, and a few errant shots nearly missed General Slocum, Davis, and Carlin. Fitch assumed that Bryant, north of the Goldsboro Road, was still in supporting distance and forgot about his left flank until Carlin pointed out an enemy force approaching Fitch's right flank. Fitch deployed one regiment facing east, and the other two swung back to defend against the flank attack in the south. Federal skirmishers north of the Goldsboro Road were still advancing, feeling for the Confederate right, but shortly after making contact, they were called without developing the true Confederate strength. South of the road, Fitch's regiment held steady despite receiving heavy fire from Hope's infantry and artillery to their front. Additional units were added to extend the Union line south, but the Union right was still in danger of being flanked. Davis ordered two brigades of uh, Morgan's division to fuel forward for the right of Collins' line and form on it. It was just after 11 a.m. Morgan's arrival caused Hope to hurry forward another Confederate brigade, once again extending the Confederate line beyond the Union right. Morgan called for Davis to send uh, Morgan's remaining brigade forward, and Davis sent his sixth and last available brigade into the fight. While this was happening, General Slocum, anxious about the delay in clearing the road and fearing the firing would be heard by General Sherman and cause the other wing of the army to delay its march, sent a staff officer to tell Sherman I would not need assistance and felt confident that he would be at the Moose River at the appointed time. Soon after sending the message, Slocum hurried forward to 20th Corps, intending to deploy it on Morgan's right south of the Goldsboro Road with a view in order to turn the Confederate position. He also ordered Morgan and Carlin to press the enemy closely and force him to develop his position with strength. Davis ordered Carlin to attack approximately 10,000 Confederates with Buell's and Miles Brigades, 12 regiments, less than 4,000 soldiers. Miles Brigade opened the attack against Hoke's position just before noon. Miles' three regiments obliqued to the, towards the right, looking for the Confederate left. They had no chance of carrying the Confederate works because of the impenetrable nature of the swamp and briars they faced, not to mention the heavy force of the trans Confederates, and Miles soon called off the attack, leaving wounded, dead, and equipment behind for the Confederates. Then where George P. Fuel, Buell was already executing Collins' orders for a flank attack, and he received orders to return to his former position and charge the enemy and discover what force was in our front. About 600 yards separated the opposing lines. At noon, the order rang down the line and the Federals sprang forward. Confederates who had been busy entrenching dropped their shovels, grabbed their rifles, and the skirmishers fell back into their lines. Concealed in the wood line, Confederates held their fire, allowing Union soldiers to approach as close as 40 yards before the rebel line erupted in the blaze of gunfire. Union soldiers suffered heavily in the stand-up fight, and were soon forced back in disarray. There they were met by General Buell, who rode among his men and roundly criticized them for faltering before the enemy works. Lieutenant Charles Brown of the 24th Michigan later expressed the views of many when he wrote, Buell, 
our brigadier is a regular mutton head and is cordially hated throughout the brigade. During this probing attack, three galvanized Confederate prisoners were captured and taken to General Carlin. They claimed to be former Union men who had been captured and enlisted as Confederates to avoid starvation. They told Carlin that Johnson was there with a large force who planned to destroy the Union left wing and then fall upon the right wing. Carlin placed one of his men on his own horse and forwarded him to Slocum, who remained skeptical of the report until his inspector general returned from the Union right and reported that something more than cavalry was facing them. Slocum now regretted sending assurances to Sherman and sent this message. I am convinced the enemy are in strong force in my front. I shall strengthen my position and fuel for their lines, and I hope you will come up in their left rear in strong force. A staff officer suggested to Slocum that even the delay of a day in reaching Goldsboro might be embarrassing. Slocum replied, I can be forged, afford to be charged with being dilatory or overcautious, but cannot afford the responsibility of another Ball's Bluff affair. Having made his decision to abandon attempts to break through the Confederate defenses astride the Goldsboro Road and to adopt a defensive posture, Slocum sent word to the 20th Corps to push forward with all possible speed. He recognized that Carlin's division had separated into two halves and that a dangerous gap existed between them at the coal farm and ordered Robertson to bring up his brigade forward and close the gap. Now Robinson and the men under his command, victims of poor judgment and poor use of intelligence at Chancellorsville and again at Gettysburg, would find themselves in much the same position at Bentonville. Major Joseph Henson of the 33rd Ohio had repeatedly called Carlin and Hobart's attention to the fact that no Union troops were occupying the rise between the right of his regiment and the Goldsboro Road. He considered this ground the key to the whole position, but his warnings had been ignored. Davis, hoping that Carlin could hold long enough for the 20th Corps to reach him, messaged Carlin to hold his position and demonstrate against the Confederates as if he were about to attack again but Carlin ignored the order. Robinson deployed his brigade between the separated halves of Carlin's division, just behind the shallow ravine which stretched across the coal field. He placed four regiments to the rear of Webb's battery and two regiments were placed in the rear line. However, two of Robinson's regiments were soon ordered to return to the Morris farm, leaving Robinson painfully short of men to fill the gap. I was so damn mad over the position my men were placed that I felt like pitching into the whole damn fraternity of commanding generals. In fact, I told General Slocum the next time three of my regiments were sent to the front and three to the rear, I would go with the latter. Slocum's chief engineer, Lieutenant William Ludlow, arrived to evaluate Cohen's position and warned him that he was entrenching on the wrong side of the road, wrong side of the ravine, and should fall back and construct a line of works at a 90 degree angle to Robinson's line. Farland ignored the advice, confident of my ability to hold my position until the troops in my rear should come up. Robinson agreed with Ludlow's assessment. I had not troops enough to fill the vacancy. Farland's line on my left, instead of being refused, was thrown forward. It seems to me it was a most dangerous and unfortunate arrangement as it rendered it much more easy to be flanked than it ought to have been. Having no entrenching tools, my men were compelled to build their breastworks with hatchets. They had nevertheless succeeded in making a respectable shelter from the fire of enemy sharpshooters when it was reliably reported that the enemy was advancing the skirmish line, apparently with the intention of obtaining possession of the buildings in the field. As it turned out, Confederates had much more than possession of the coal farm buildings on their minds. At 2.45 p.m., William Hardy rode down the front of the line of the Army of Tennessee and waved it forward. On the right of Buell's wing, Lieutenant Bates of the 21st Michigan described the Confederate advance. As far as we could see, both our right and left, they were coming in unbroken lines with that old yell we had learned to know so well. We held their position, keeping up a continuous and rapid fire until we could see their trap closing in around us as they enveloped their flanks and subjected them to their, their fire. It was impossible to maintain our position. 
Walthall's command and Loring's division emerged from the ravine north of the cold house and forced back Robinson's skirmishers. Hill's corps collided with Bryant's wing of Hobart's brigade and passed around its right flank and Hobart's line broke. Now, as Carlin had been warned, the ravine proved difficult to negotiate and Carlin's men were shot to pieces while ascending its opposite bank. With the flight of Carlin's men and the advance of Loring's Confederates, Robinson's position became untenable. Webb's 19th Indiana Battery abandoned its guns. The left section was overrun and captured. Amid the counting confusion, Robinson quickly saw his position was hopeless as Buell's collapse had rendered Robinson's left flank and rear wide open. The brigade began to fall back in good order. Robinson himself carried the brigade colors back. Lieutenant Colonel Charles McClurg, Jefferson Davis's adjutant, described the scene of Carlin's collapse. Masses of men slowly and doggedly falling back along the road, through the fields and open woods on the left of the road, many balls whizzing in every direction, the roar of musketry and artillery now continuous. I saw rebel regiments in front, in full view, stretching to the fields as far as the eye could reach, advancing rapidly and firing as they came. The onward sweep of the rebel lines was like the waves of the ocean resistless. While the day had not gone well for General Slocum, despite the collapse of Carlin's 14th Corps line north of the Goldsboro Road, it was not yet lost. Slocum had devised a two-part plan for dealing with Johnson's army at Bentonville. The first part, an attempt to stop Johnson's 14th Corps with some assistance from the 20th Corps troops had not gone well. Now it was time for the second part of his plan. Using the 20th Corps to establish a defensive fortress behind Carlin's advanced position, Slocum chose a narrow strip of ground near the Morris Farm where six artillery batteries could be placed. For Slocum's plan to work, the Goldsboro Road had to be blocked by a position to not be turned. Colonel James Selfridge of the 1st Division of the 20th Corps was ordered to position his brigade across the road at the Morris Farm. Engineers staked out a clear and cleared an artillery position behind Selfridge. Six batteries would eventually be placed there. Infantry was extended on both flanks to prevent the position from being turned. General Williams pulled Colonel William Holly's brigade black and back and placed him near the ravine left of the Goldsboro Road. 400 yards to Holly's right and mostly above the road was Robinson's brigade. There was no gap between the two, but 200 yards behind the gap was Selfridge and behind Selfridge the artillery. No matter which point the Confederates attacked, their formation would face an infilade of flanking fire. Daylight was fading as the Confederate attack began when Bate and Tolliver launched heavy attacks probing for a weakness in a rapidly strengthening Union 20th Corps line. In preparation for a possible Confederate assault, the 13th New Jersey and 82nd Illinois regiments had crossed the Morris Farm ravine and were now positioned in a wooden line facing east, directly on the Confederate right flank. Tolliver's two brigades, Elliott's and Wretch, left the cover of the woods and were immediately staggered by Union artillery fire, but still lunged forward. Disaster struck Elliott's brigade when rebel lines swept within range of the 13th New Jersey and 82nd Illinois and were ranked, raked with the heavy volleys from this unexpected quarter. Elliott's right flank melted away and the race to the rear was on. Red's brigade, commanded by Colonel William C. Butler, from its position 100 yards to the rear of Elliott, continued on, aiming for a gap in the Union line occupied by Stevens' battery. Despite witnessing the rout of Elliott's brigade, <clears throat> Rhett's brigade closed to within 30 yards of Robinson's left flank. Caught in a withering crossfire, Robinson's leftmost regiment panicked and broke for the rear. To its right, the commander of the 143rd New York, Lieutenant Colonel Hezekiah Watkins, saw the danger and galloped over and halted the regiment's color bearer. Watkins rose up in his stirrups and shouted, Halt! Who's in command? Someone named the commander and Watkins shouted, I outrank him about face and hold your line. The regiment rallied on the colors and the position was held. Regiment Red's men reformed and made four more assaults, each time facing more Union guns as the Union artillery position built strength. Confederates emerged from the woods one last time as the sun went down. This time they came silently and marched steadily towards Robinson's men, who gave them the heaviest musketry yet, but still they came on. It was a tense moment for Union General Slocum, Williams, 
Davis and Kilpatrick, who were behind the batteries watching. Robinson's brigade held fast, and with it, the Union line at the Morris Farm. Slocum's left wing was safe and could now await the arrival of General Sherman with General Howard's right wing. Over the next two days, Sherman's combined force proved too much for Johnston, and late on March 21st, he began to fall back toward Smithfield, leaving Sherman free to continue the march to Goldsboro. So three times during the Civil War, at Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and again at Bentonville, James Robinson was placed in an untenable position by commanders who either failed to gather or failed to properly interpret intelligence. Three times, he and his men had been victimized by this failure of command. Well, no doubt, Arthur Winfrey and Colin Powell have a point. Failure and mistakes do offer a chance to learn and grow. For James Robinson, victimized by men who would not be counseled, it was all too clear that while mistakes offer an opportunity to learn, they are often, all too often, repeated. So, uh, thank you for watching this presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it.